Hi everyone, welcome to um, the University of Sydney's masterclass sessions. We'll just wait a few minutes as people start to enter into the room. Um, we'll allow a few minutes for people to arrive and then we'll get started in the masterclass. So tonight's session is one of a broader series of events that the university runs, um, designed to give you a bit of a taste of what it's like to be a University of Sydney student, um, studying in the particular degree that you're interested in. Um, so tonight's class is an in-depth look at a particular topic um, taken from courses that are taught under the Master of Economic Analysis and um, for students who are interested in any of our postgraduate economics programs. Throughout the presentation tonight, you'll be able to um, ask any questions in the chat box. We'll also post up um, a relevant link throughout the session. And then at the very end of the session, we'll allow you to turn your cameras and your microphones on. So if you've got questions um, that you'd like to answer in more detail, you can have a bit more of a conversation um, about that. And I'll just let you know that we are recording the session tonight. So um, right at the very end, just letting you know that you've got your camera on, we are recording this. Um, if you do not wish to have any of your um, footage used in any way, so we often put these recordings up onto the website so that people who missed the session can still watch them, please just send me a message in the chat so I can know that we can edit that part of um, the questions, question time out of the presentation. We'll just wait a few more minutes. Thank you for everyone that's joining us now. We're just waiting for a few more people to come in through the, um, come into the webinar and we'll be starting shortly. All right, well, I think we can probably get started now. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Chris Gibbs, who will be presenting tonight. Um, and he is a lecturer and thesis coordinator in the Master of Economic Analysis. Over to you, Chris. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yep, that's uh, correct. So uh, I'm the Honours and Master's uh, Thesis Coordinator, so it's my job to help those who are going to be writing theses uh, to match with supervisors. Um, so if you're interested in that degree program, you'll, you'll get to know me very well. Um, most of my teaching is in the uh, Masters of Economics, um, and that's uh, where I'll start. So uh, the background for this lecture that I'm going to give tonight is I basically pulled on materials that I teach in Econ 6002 in my Macroeconomic Analysis 1. Um, in addition, uh, I'm a member of the Global Perspectives on Economic Policy uh, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Future Fix program. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful, uh, but essentially uh, it's a, a program where we bring in scholars, or we did before border closures, from uh, around the world um, to talk about macroeconomic issues um, that are relevant uh, to um, global policy. And we had focused mostly on people who have uh, affiliations with uh, central banks, IMF, um, the BIS, and when these people come through, or more recently, as with the coronavirus restrictions uh, online, we, we would interview them and put these interviews up in, in podcasts. And we've done a series of these podcasts um, 
which you can find online. So I believe Elizabeth is going to share the, the link for you if you're, you're interested in these. And so I've just pulled together um, some of the, the insights that I've gleaned um, from the, uh, some of these uh, people that we've interviewed. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk to you tonight about research on optimal, optimal uh, policy responses to a pandemic um, from a paper by Callum Jones, who's at the International Monetary Fund. And I'll also talk to you about another paper by Professor Greg Kaplan, who's actually uh, a visiting professor here at the University of Sydney right now, but uh, his main job is at the University of Chicago. Um, so that's what I'm gonna pull together for you guys tonight uh, and give you uh, basically a preview of what it would be like to be in one of my classes right now, because this is basically what it feels like. Uh, so without further ado, there we go. All right, uh, so I'm gonna take two parts on here. So the first part, uh, I wanna just talk about the economics of the pandemic, and I'm gonna basically do this from a model-based approach. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, basically a series of three models. Each one is gonna become more complicated, and we're gonna use these models to try to answer some basic questions about uh, the pandemic and its effect on the economy with the main question being, um, well, what effect does a pandemic have on the economy just in isolation? And then what are the policy steps that a government could take to mitigate these effects? Um, uh, you know, the sort of lives versus the economy debate that has been you know, raging through the opinion pages of most global newspapers and uh, of course has been shaping policy all over the world. Uh, and then the second part of the talk, I want to step back and think about what are the challenges that are going to face the economy um, after we're sort of done with the pandemic and now we have uh, basically an economic mess uh, to clean up. And this is gonna revolve around two different issues, which is one is the effective zero lower bound on interest rates and the other one is I'll have a brief discussion about um, debts and deficits. So part one, uh, the economics of pandemics. So what I'd like to show for you first is actually present to you the actual canonical model of disease spread or a pandemic, uh, a so-called SEER model. Um, this is basically the model uh, as that um, you know, most epidemiologists have in their head uh, when they're thinking about you know, how a virus is gonna spread through a country or through a community. Um, and it's actually a very, very simple model. And so I just wanna walk you through the basic intuitions of this model and I, I think you'll be surprised at sort of the, 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 the simple insights you can glean. And then we're gonna use it um, to think about uh, economic policy that we can layer on top of it. So the, the canonical model uh, of SEER is basically just a model that looks at susceptible and in infectious and recovered people. And it basically is just a flow model that just tracks how people move between these three categories. Uh, of course, you can also add death on here as well. Um, but I'm gonna keep it simple and just think about three states of the world. You can either be susceptible to the disease, you can be infected, or you can be recovered. And some portion of recovered, unfortunately, would, would also be dead. Um, the model simply tries to capture transitions between these states. So there's no decisions that are being made. Um, there's no human behavior at all. It's, it's basically just raw exponential growth. Uh, and that's also why, you know, many Politicians, economists, many people in lots of different disciplines have sort of pushed back on sort of the, the base recommendations that you get from epidemiology, specifically for the fact that these models don't take into account human behavior. And so that's what we're going to ultimately end up trying to get to tonight is, you know, see what happens when you, you add human behavior into these models. But here it is. Here's what the basic model looks like. Uh, it's basically defined by three equations, which you can see uh, up there under model dynamics, which basically just describe how you move between the three different states, where S dot, I dot, and R dot is just saying the time derivative of uh, the, or the change of each of these uh, states. So with the first one, this S dot, it basically says it has a negative over here, and it says that take the number of people who are susceptible to a disease, ST, multiply it by the number of people who are infected, and with some parameter beta, that's how many people are moving from being susceptible into infected. So as people become infected, there are fewer and fewer uh, susceptible people in the economy. Uh, for I, infected, 
the number of infections is based on, well, how many people are susceptible to the disease minus how many people in the economy are recovered from the disease. That's how many can possibly be infected. And so this governs the rate into infection. And then R is basically just the rate of how people transition from being infected to being recovered. And at all times, we're gonna make sure that all of these things add up to one. So the number of susceptible, infected, and recovered always has to add up to one. Um, as I said, this is a very, very simple model in the sense that it, it only has two parameters that govern everything that happens in it. It has this beta parameter, which is the transition rate. So it basically is a parameter that measures how easily a person spreads the virus. And then we have the gamma parameter, which tells you how long or how quickly somebody recovers. You can think about this, how long is somebody infectious or how long, or, or, you know, how long does the disease last for them? Now, a term that you have probably seen um, many times in the popular press is this term of this term, uh, R naught. Um, and R naught is defined by these two parameters in this model. So when you hear somebody saying, oh, you know, COVID-19 has an R naught of 2.5 of three, literally what they're saying to you is they're telling you the ratio of beta to gamma. And you can think about why this would make sense, right? If beta is the transmission rate, and gamma is the recovery rate, it's basically saying take how, um, how easily the virus spreads and then scale that by gamma, which is how long somebody is gonna be infectious for, right? The faster somebody recovers, so the larger gamma is, the smaller the R naught's gonna be. Okay, and then to analyze this simple model, you basically have to just look at, at one equation and mainly what we really care about is we care about the growth rate of infections. And so you can represent a growth rate in this simple model by just taking I dot, the change in infections and dividing it by the number of current infections and this reduces down to a growth rate. If you do that, you're gonna be left with an equation that looks like this, which basically just says beta times ST, the number of people who are susceptible minus gamma, where again, gamma was that uh, recovery rate. And then if you say, okay, when is the growth rate of infections equal to zero? Take that and solve for S. When you do that, you're gonna get this relationship S star, which is equal to gamma over beta, which would also be equal to one over R naught. And that my friends is something you probably have also heard many, many times in the popular press. This is herd immunity. So S star is what is known as the herd immunity threshold. So that tells you essentially where the growth rate of infections is going to equal zero. For COVID-19, it's thought that R0 is somewhere between 2.5 and 3. So that means that herd immunity is going to happen when there are between 30 and 40% of the population who are still susceptible. In other words, you need 60 to 70% of the population to have gotten the disease. However, in the popular press, uh, they normally leave something out when they talk about herd immunity, is the pandemic does not end at herd immunity. This is a graph of what happens in this simple model. So the red line here shows basically the path if you just at the beginning of time when you have 100% susceptible people, you just infect one person and then you let the exponential dynamics take over. And you can see that the percentage of the population that's, that is infected grows over time but then at a decreasing rate until that growth rate hits zero at this black line right here. And that black line right there, that is the herd immunity threshold. So it's at 40% susceptibility or 60% of the population has now become infected. However, notice there's still a lot of red line over here. In fact, without any mitigation, you still end up with nearly 90% of the population infected with COVID-19, despite the fact the herd immunity threshold was over here uh, at 40%. Um, and this is the low end for R0. So if you think R0 for COVID-19 is really three or four, um, that means before the pandemic ends, if you did nothing, you would end up with 95, 96, you know, close to 100% of people in the economy affected with COVID-19. 
Now, the reason why people talk about herd immunity and why herd immunity is a desirable thing is illustrated by the direction of the arrows you can see over here. So in, in reality, right, and as we're going to show when we layer this inside of a macro model, it isn't the case that the disease just goes unabated and runs its course. In fact, once the disease gets started, people take uh, protections to um, you know, protect themselves and the disease will die down for a little bit. So if you are on this side of the herd immunity line though, anytime you're, anytime you're seeded with a new infection, the lines basically on here show you which direction will happen. So say you were on uh, the, uh, uh, an upward trajectory like this, say what was happening in um, you know, um, March and April of this year. Uh, we then put in stay of home orders in effect that say drove us back down to here. Well, when those effects end, you basically are gonna follow the dynamics that are over here again. And so you're gonna go back onto this again. If you put in more stay at home orders, you might drive it back down to here. But again, when the virus takes off, you're gonna have this dynamic again. If you're past the herd immunity threshold though, when the virus props up in the community, say you had you know, a large outbreak, that outbreak will die down very quick. Any new seeded thing, all the arrows are pointed down, so the outbreak dies down very, very quickly. So that's you know, basically the principle of vaccination, right? So even in Australia, if you think about a, a disease like measles, which has an R naught of something like 15, um, you know, it still crops up every now and then, but because we're, you know, the, we're for the most part on the right side of the herd immunity threshold, it quickly dies out in the population. So the disease doesn't go away, but you don't get this exponential growth like you're gonna see on this side of the graph. Okay, so that's herd immunity um, and that's the basic SEER model. Um, in case you're interested, another thing that you often see is many people you know, wanna compare COVID-19 to the common flu. Well, I've done for you what seasonal flu looks like. The r naught of seasonal flu is about 1.4 and so this is what uh, a flu virus that got into the community where there was no herd immunity, uh, um, what it would look like. So even if you thought that COVID-19 was um, just as, or just as uh, deadly as flu was, and to be clear, there's no evidence of that. If our best guess is that COVID-19 is something like five times more deadly than, than the common flu. Um, you're still gonna have a problem in the fact that COVID-19 is just much, much more infectious. And this higher infection rate actually is also going to matter for the economic decisions. Okay, so that's the basic SEER model. Uh, now that you have that in your heads, um, let's layer an economic model on top of that. And for what I'm going to do here is I'm going to follow um, the work by uh, Jones et al. from um, the International Monetary Fund. And as I said, you can listen to the podcast interview that we, we did with him. Um, you can also check out his paper. It's a very nice paper. Um, and his paper is the, the macroeconomics of a SEER model. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to think about this beta parameter. So the part that governs how, suscept or how a susceptible person becomes infected. And we're now going to assume that people's economic decisions are going to affect how easily they can become infected. So what we're going to do is we're going to take basically the simplest and cleanest economic environment that we can imagine. We're going to assume an economy populated by people that consume, people that work, people that don't like to be sick, and people that are afraid of dying. So that's going to be the households in this economy and what motivates them. Firms in this economy are going to be perfectly competitive, um, but they're going to allow working from home However, if people want to work from home, it's going to require some investment and there's going to be some learning by doing, meaning you can't just immediately decide in the morning that you're going to work from home and you're just as productive as you were before. But otherwise than that, there's not going to be any other firm side um, issues in the economy that you have to think about. So this is going to be uh, what's sometimes referred to as a neoclassical model. So there's not going to be any of the other frictions that you might uh, be concerned about in a pandemic in the sense that the people who live in this economy, they don't have to pay mortgages. The firms don't have um, you know, rental contracts they have to satisfy. 
Uh, the people, they can decide to stop working today and immediately start working tomorrow. They don't have to worry about being separated from a job and searching for a new one. So we're abstracting away from all those other issues, which are very important and which we'll, we'll come back to. But we're just trying to get down what are the basic economic incentives that are going to arise if you show up and if a pandemic occurs and you have people that basically are motivated by these four things I've listed up here, that they want to consume, they want to work, they don't like to be sick, and they don't want to die. Um, so the pandemic is basically going to follow the SEER dynamics. So those equations that I showed you before, those are going to be inside this model. And that's going to determine who gets infected, who um, and how many people are susceptible and recovered and, and die over time. And the big exception we're going to make, though, is now beta is going to depend on people's decisions. So how easily the disease is going to be transmitted is going to depend on what people do. If you work home, if you work less, and you consume less, that's all going to lower transmission. And in addition to that, we're going to assume that these agents know that a vaccine is likely in the future, but at an uncertain date. And this is important, right, because you're going to take different actions if you know a vaccine is likely to arrive than you would if you thought that this pandemic, there was no, you know, cure on the horizon. So that would affect, you know, what, what you would do. I'm not going to show you very many equations, but just to, you know, give you a taste of uh, what you will learn in, in your classes and, and how we would model such behavior, I just want to show you a, a couple of the assumptions. So how do we embed into the households all the things that I told you that they like to do? Well, we do it in, in something that, that looks like this, where we're going to say that agents have utility over consumption and um, leisure, or, in this, or labor supply in this case, which is going to be functioned as a, a disutility. They don't like to work. Um, and we're going to take these with respect to the fact that certain members of the household at any given time are, affected, are infected. and at any given time, some members of your household might die. So you can think about this as a, a household level utility function about uh, you know, one house, multiple people in it. Um, they get utility from consuming. They get uh, disutility when they have to work. And they're going to have to compensate for the fact that during the pandemic, some people are going to be too sick to work. And uh, unfortunately, other, others may die. How we model utility is we're going to say that it's the log of consumption. And the reason we use the logarithm here is we just want to give some curvature to their consumption. So if you think about what this would look like, um, it's going to be, you know, sort of a, a function that, that looks like this. You're going to have diminishing returns, essentially, to um, how much you like to consume. So you're going to get more utility the more you consume, um, but at a, at a decreasing rate. Uh, you're not going to like to work. So that's why you have a, a minus sign here. Uh, this kappa right here is going to tell you the proportion of people who are infected who are too sick to work. So we're going to subtract out basically their disutility of labor because they're not working. Um, but we'll add back uh, something here, which is they get an extra disutility because they don't like being sick. And then, of course, there's going to be this penalty for dying. People really don't like to die. And this is going to be a forward-looking model. So it's not just death that is bad. It's the knowledge that you could die that is going to affect people's decisions. Okay, on the production side, as I said, production is going to be really, really simple. The firm side of this economy is going to be really, really simple. We're just going to assume all the labor you supply gets turned one to one into output. So, you know, there's no, um, you know, no complicated employment arrangements or anything like that we have to think about. Again, we just want to model just what are the basic incentives of these households there are lots of other interesting things to consider. And as I said, we're going to go to a more complicated model in a minute. But as of right now, we just want to model the incentives. The last two pieces we're going to, I'm going to show you are, we're going to assume that there's going to be a hospital congestion uh, assumption in this model, which is essentially the death rate in this model. We're going to make it an increasing function of the number of people in the household who are too sick to work. And this basically is going to capture the idea that if too many people are sick all at one time, that's going to strain the resources of a hospital and the death rate is going to go up. And we want to build this into the model because we want agents to understand that this is going to happen, right? In reality, you know, if you remember 
uh, what we were, we were all thinking in, in February and March when this whole thing started. I mean, everybody was talking about, all right, we need to social distance so that we don't collapse the hospital system. So it's perfectly reasonable to know that, or to build into this model, that these agents are gonna know that, gee, if they get sick when everybody else is sick, their probability of dying is gonna go up. And we need to think about how they're gonna optimally change their decisions based on that risk. And then the last thing is, this E term right here, which is basically gonna be what is gonna interact with beta to raise or lower the transmission rate. And essentially what it's gonna say is um, the less you shop uh, or the less you consume, the lower your exposure rate is, the less you work, the lower your exposure rate. And then this MT right here is gonna measure working from home, the more you work from home, the lower your exposure rate is going to be. Okay, so we set that whole thing up and then we solve for optimal decisions. And what do we learn? Well, individual optimal decisions work out something like this. Essentially, agents have an incentive to reduce consumption and labor supply to reduce exposure. Maybe not surprising. However, the second place that we learn maybe might be surprising to you. Uh, the model shows that there's a fatalism effect or what the authors call a fatalism effect where rationally, when infections are low, people will actually take less precautions to protect themselves from the virus. Um, so because of that hospital congestion problem, it's gonna be better to get the, the virus early before the hospitals are crowded than to get it late. And so rationally, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, people are going to want to actually go out, work more, consume more, be out and about more before the, before the pandemic gets bad. And this is actually gonna set up a, a really interesting dynamic here, right? Because uh, you know, as we've seen the world over, it's very hard to put in restrictions in place on people's movements when the amount of infections in the community are low. And this model actually gives you a rational reason for that. So rationally, the agents in this economy who are doing everything perfectly and perfectly understand the situation they find themselves in, it is actually rational for them to not want to stay at home, to work more, to consume more at the beginning, basically an expectation of the fact that things are going to get really bad and they're going to have to curtail their activities later on. And so you kind of already see this, this natural inclination when you see people who are resisting sort of you know, measures early on in a pandemic, um, you know, that's not necessarily because they're dumb. They're actually rationally thinking about how this would work. So what are the consequences of these individual decisions? Well, one, there's going to be a large recession, uh, a very large recession, and it's going to be prolonged and last for months. Uh, the reason for that is, is because people are cutting back on their consumption, they're cutting back on their labor supply. So notice that that is a conclusion, and I have not talked about anything about any sort of policy mitigations. There's no lockdowns in this economy. There's nobody telling these people to do anything. All they're doing is rationally responding to the incentives in front of them, and they're choosing when the infections get high enough to consume less, work less in order to protect themselves, and that's going to generate a very large recession. So unfortunately, this says the economic incentives are there's no way around not having one. The plus side of that, though, is because of private mitigation, R no, R not is going to be much reduced in this model, and there are going to be far fewer total infections and deaths than the SEER model would suggest. So, um, you know, people take precautions to protect themselves, and the dire predictions that you get out of just a straight uh, epidemiology model, uh, this model says, are, are not going to come true. In fact, in some cases, they're, they're half the size because people take steps to protect themselves. So um, in the paper, uh, they simulate out what this economy would look like, and I'm going to walk you through what these diagrams do. Um, and they, they show three separate cases to show you how each of these things interact. So the blue case up here that's labeled exogenous, this is this, the SEER dynamics on their own. So this is what happens if economic decisions have no effect on the course of the pandemic, and we just let the SEER dynamics take over. Now, in the simulations that they run here, they choose a higher R naught than I showed you earlier. And that's why the, the peak percentage of total infections is higher here. It ends up being around 40%. I think there are not with something like 
macro, uh, the, the red line here, the macro case, that shows you what happens if agents can now affect um, uh, their, infect or their, their infection risk uh, by making macroeconomic decisions. Uh, however, we're, we're not allowing them to work from home. And then the yellow line is what happens if you can make these decisions, plus you actually have the ability to work from home. As you can see, people will optimally make decisions, which will much, much reduce uh, the severity of the, um, the pandemic. So for the work from home case, the pandemic will be half as severe as would have been predicted by just a basic SEER model. And again, if you look down here, this shows you deaths. Um, you know, you basically cut the death rate by about 70, 80%. Um, just naturally from what the SEER model would predict, people take responses to, to cut that down significantly. On the next slide, I can show you what happens to the economic variables in the model. So the key one to really focus on here is this graph um, in the top left-hand corner, um, which shows you um, what happens to labor supplied and consumption. And recall that labor supply and output are one for one here. So L and Y are gonna be the same. Um, for the blue line, again, we are looking at the case where uh, individual decisions do not affect the pandemic, so it doesn't matter what you do, you can't change your infection risk. And you actually see something quite curious, which is L, uh, labor supply, actually goes up uh, during the pandemic. And the reason for this is because members of the household get sick and can no longer work, people actually have to make up for that uh, by working more. And they choose to do that because it doesn't really matter if they stay home or they work, they can't change their infection risk. So you get sort of this counterfactual prediction of, of labor supply actually rising. In the two cases where you can affect your uh, infection risk though, the, the yellow line and the, the red line, uh, you do see that both consumption and output are, are greatly reduced. Um, and what you also see over here is you um, see this fatalism effect in action. So essentially notice that at the beginning of the pandemic, both of these things actually rise. Over here, we have two values uh, from the model that basically measure the incentives that people have to mitigate, um, to mitigate uh, their risk. And you can see again with these values, they're negative and negative at the beginning of the pandemic, um, which shows this fatalism effect that rationally what these people wanna do is they actually wanna do more at the beginning of the pandemic um, in order to, uh, uh, you know, um, make hay while the, the sun shines, uh, you know, as, as the saying goes. Okay, so that's what happens just looking at the basic economic decisions. Um, the key question now would be, is there gonna be a scope for policy in this model? And honestly, it, it shouldn't be clear that necessarily there is a scope for policy in this model because we've started with a neoclassical economy where there are no market frictions. And if there are no market frictions, there's actually no role for government to improve on any of the economic outcomes. Whatever the market delivers is the optimal outcome. Um, this is actually something that I, I try to drive home a lot in my classes uh, because I, I think this is lost on people who haven't studied um, economic modeling uh, or economic theory very deeply, is you sort of get this idea that, you know, that economic, that in economics, you know, there are certain like hard truths out there. Uh, and that's really not true. It, it all depends on the assumptions you put in the model. And if you put in a model that has markets delivered perfect outcomes, then you're always going to find that government policy has, has no effect. So you actually have to build a problem into your model in order to have a reason for policy to exist. Um, and many people will sort of claim that, oh, well, you know, you, you know, policy doesn't matter and here's the theory why, but then they don't bother to say that, well, actually I, I built a model that already assumed that policy couldn't do anything in this model. And now I've, you know, tried to talk past you. So be, be wary of, of that. Okay. Um, so, the answer though in this model is gonna be yes, that there, there actually is gonna be uh, an issue in this model that's gonna crop up despite the fact that we, we don't have any frictions in the model. And the problem that is gonna crop up is the pandemic is gonna create an externality. Um, what is an externality? Well, an externality is a cost or a benefit to an economic activity that's not borne by the decision maker and hence not factored into his or her decision. So, 
people in this model, the externality is going to be people only consider their personal risk of catching the virus. They don't internalize their impact of spreading the virus. And you can see how this becomes really bad uh, when you have high R knots, right? Because you can only get the virus once, at least in this world, so there's no reinfection in this world, but you can give the virus to two and a half, three, four people on average. So your risk of getting it versus your risk to the public once you have it don't line up. And this is also something that's going to make this different from like the regular flu, right? Because as closer that R naught gets to one, the more your personal incentives and society's incentives get closer to lining up. So you have this big externality where people aren't taking into account the fact that they're actually going to be infecting others. And this is clearly what's going on, right, with this fatalism effect. This fatalism effect wouldn't happen if people were taking into account this risk. So what we can ask is, is if we made the agents in this economy internalize that external, externality, so they had to calculate that cost into their own utility, what would they do? So this is a way of backing out what a policymaker, what an optimal policy would look like. And so what we're gonna ask is, is you know, what would they, how would their behavior be different and sort of what would be the timing of their behavior? And that'll give us some idea of, of what a lockdown should, how you should design a lockdown. And this is what the solution looks like when they, they have to take into account um, those incentives. And so you can see down here, the incentive to mitigate, notice it's all positive. And notice as well that it's largest at the beginning of the pandemic. So rather than having this fatalism effect where you wanna work more in the pandemic, you actually wanna cut most right at the beginning. Now, notice the policy challenge you're gonna have here, right? Because Rationally, the individuals in this economy are going to want to do more when the infection rate is low. And the optimal thing to do when they inter if you internalize this externality is to tell them to do less. So the fact that we had massive conflicts between people who were saying, why are we locking down right now when infection rates are so low? Or why are we keeping restrictions on when the infection rates are so low? You know, there's a tendency to say that these people aren't behaving rationally if you're on the side of, of lockdowns. Um, but really, they're really just following their own incentives. The, the rationality says, no, they want to make hay while the sun is shining um, because they're not taking into account this externality. But if you do, there's going to be a short, sharp lockdown to begin with. This is going to come at a cost of, of a larger recession. So, oh, sorry, got to get off my... Um, and this is what happens to the dynamics. So you can see that with uh, that sort of policy, you, you something like, you know, uh, more than half um, the amount of death in the economy by doing this, the total infection rate is, is much, much lower. So uh, this can be uh, an effective policy. All right, so what did we learn from this? Well, we learned it's optimal to impose some restrictions on economic activity. Uh, the restrictions should be put in place early and you should encourage working from home as early as possible. Uh, as far as the economy versus the lives, uh, lives issue, um, well, one, we found out that there's going to be a big recession anyway. Uh, restrictions are going to lead to a larger construction by cons a larger recession by construction, but as I said, it's by construction because that's how you actually lower the transmission risk. But what you get for that is mortality is, is significantly reduced. Now, as I said, you know, what, what can be missing about this? Well, there are no market imperfections. There's no heterogeneity in the type of people here and wealth and income. There's also no fiscal policy. So if we wanted to go to a, a broader look, a more complicated model, which I won't go into nearly as much detail, we could look at a paper like this one um, by uh, Greg Kaplan and co-authors, which is the subject of the other podcast I mentioned at the beginning. And they're gonna build in a much more rich uh, uh, features into the economy. So all the things that you think might have been missing from that one, most of those things are going to be there. So there's going to be many different types of occupations. These different occupations are going to have different exposure levels. There's going to be different types of households that are going to have different levels of income, wealth, ability to borrow, you know, different abilities to social distance. There's going to be market imperfections. Uh, you know, people are going to have to worry about paying their mortgages here. There's going to be contracts and stuff that can worsen the effects of either lockdown or the recession, 
all of that's going to be built in. And in addition to that, they're going to have a rich fiscal policy sector that's going to allow the government to provide uh, transfers and tax relief. And when you do that, you can end up with a model that, that looks, um, what produces an outcome like this, which is their, their main selling point that comes out of it is they get what's called a pandemic possibilities frontier. And it basically tries to map out precisely the lives versus the economy trade-off. So if you look over here on the y-axis, what I have is I have economic welfare costs that is gonna be measured in multiples of monthly income. So two would be you're giving up two months of income on for the average person in the economy for this outcome. And then this line down here, this is a percent of our percent of deaths as a percent of the population. So this shows you, you know, how many deaths you can expect. At this end right here, we have laissez-faire. So this is the idea where you don't do anything. There's no government policy. You just let people make optimal decisions on their own. And then they analyze all the way up to 17 month lockdowns. The orange versus the blue is basically they, they plug in US policy from March, April, May. And they say, if you had US policy with the fiscal transfers, how much does it change this, this curve? And you can see when you give fiscal support to people, it shifts it down and makes it uh, less costly on average. A couple of things I just wanna point out here is that this actually shows you that this lives versus the economy debate is, is much more subtle in the sense that there are two regions on this graph where there actually isn't much of a trade-off between lives and the economy. So here and here, right, you can actually significantly decrease the death rate in the economy without giving up very much economic activity. And likewise up here, you can essentially increase the, uh, or take the death rate to zero without much of a trade-off on losing extra economic output. It turns out that all of the lives versus the economy happens in this upwardly slope, up, upwardly slope portion. And you can really think about why that is, right? Because there are, there are simple things you can do to prevent the spread, simple policies you can take on, um, all the way up to, you know, sort of Melbourne style lockdowns, which put you up here. And it's only when you go from, say, shutting down all businesses, you get that big jump up in economic costs. But there are large segments where you can put in lots of policies, you can increase the duration of your lockdown, where you can save a substantial amount of lives without much um, um, cost uh, to the economy. Um, and the last thing I want to say about this makes clear is, again, even in this model, you have to see down here that there is, there's no free lunch in economics. There's no free lunch uh, as far as the pandemic goes. A large recession was going to happen regardless of what you did. Um, so even when you have uh, large fiscal transfers and if you did nothing, you're still going to have a recession that would be on the magnitude of what happened during the, the financial crisis uh, 12 years ago now. Um, even without doing any sort of intervention policies. Okay, so we're at part two, and I think I've actually come close to using up all my time. I don't know, Elizabeth, do I, where, where am I at on time? Um, we've got the whole session goes until 6.30, so um, you could do another five to 10 minutes. Okay, but this is much shorter than what I did before, so okay. I'll, 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 I'll make it quick. We're almost there, I think I only have like five more slides. Okay, um, so what are the problems going forward? So we, we've now uh, hopefully thoroughly schooled you in sort of the economics of a pandemic and sort of what the trade-offs are. Now let's think about what happens when the pandemic's over and now we just have a, 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 a thoroughly ravaged economy that we're looking to um, you know, perk back up. Um, what, what are gonna be the main policy challenges? And I think the most important challenge that I wanna draw your attention to is this idea of the effective zero lower bound on interest rates. Now, what is the effective zero lower bound? Well, paper or plastic currency, as the case may be in Australia, pays a 0% interest rate, right? If I hold currency, it pays 0%. Because currency exists, no one ever needs to accept an interest rate below zero. You might be saying, gee, Chris, but wait, I know that there are some countries like in Japan and in Europe that they actually did negative interest rates. And I say to you, that is true. You can go slightly negative, which is why it's called the effective zero lower bound, because there are storage costs. You know, if you have a billion dollars um, 
and you want to hold it in currency, you need a warehouse and you need guards. That costs money. Because of storage costs, you can go slightly negative, but there are clear limits. If you tried to do negative 10% interest rates, all the money would be withdrawn from the banking system and you'd have an even bigger problem on your hands. So there is a clear lower bound to how low monetary policymakers can push the interest rates that is going to constrain them. Now, why should you care about this? Well, the ZLB turns much of economics on its head. And the worst thing that happens is the self-correcting mechanisms of the economy short circuit. And in extreme cases, you can get stagnation that lasts for decades. So this is one explanation of the problems that Japan has seen since the middle of the 1990s when they hit the zero lower bound. It's also the explanation for many of the problems we encountered during the Great Depression. Why is the zero lower bound bad? To do that, to see why that is, you really only need to understand one equation, which is called the Fisher equation, which is the equation that relates nominal interest rates to real interest rates. So real interest rates are the things that you actually make decisions on. Whether you know it or not, you respond to real incentives, not nominal incentives. In this equation, you can see that if I set the nominal interest rate to zero and I rearrange, the real interest rate becomes a direct function of what my inflation expectations are. And this is gonna cause serious problems in an economic downturn. The reason is, is if inflation falls, so imagine we had deflation here, so inflation is a negative number. A minus times a minus is positive. That means real interest rates are rising. And if real interest rates are rising, that means the economy starts contracting. Why is that? Well, think about what would happen in deflation. So say you're wanting to buy a house and you think house prices are going to fall next year. And so you say, I'm not going to buy a house this year, I'm going to buy a house next year. What happens to your consumption and savings this year? Well, you would increase your savings this year because you did not purchase a house, so you did not consume that, you increased your savings. What is the market incentive for increasing your savings? Well, it's a higher real interest rate, right? That, that's that's the, the concept you can capture why that behavior happened. And it's not just housing this can happen, it can happen for consumption in all sorts of places. So essentially people start bringing their uh, savings forward and not consuming today, and that starts to contract the economy. But of course, if the economy starts to contract, inflation falls. If inflation falls, the real interest rate rises again and the cycle completes and the cycle you know, kicks over again and we fall farther and farther into a hole. So clearly bad. So this gets us to the paradoxes that come out when you're at the zero lower bound. The first one is the paradox of thrift. So essentially policies that are gonna increase savings at the zero lower bound are actually gonna decrease economic activity as we've just talked about and can actually lead to lower overall savings in aggregate. Another way to think about this is when the nominal interest rate can no longer move, the market mechanism that directs your savings to profitable um, investments is broken. There's now no market force that's pushing your savings around. Instead, your savings just ends up as lower consumption and it never gets channeled into investment. Next, we have the paradox of toil. And this basically flips what normally are economic stimulating policies into policies that contract the economy. And essentially any policy that makes people more willing to work, such as tax cuts, labor income taxes, tax cuts, uh, business, you know, things to help businesses, these actually contract the economy rather than expand the economy. And the reason being is because all of these policies put downward pressure on inflation. And anytime you put downward pressure on inflation at the ZLB, you're raising the real interest rate. And finally, the central bank is completely powerless. Well, not completely, we'll talk about what they can do, but they have much less power than they normally would to actually push inflation around. In fact, money printing, holding fiscal policy constant, basically has no effect. Bonds and money, when interest rates are zero, are basically the same thing. And this is a point that is quite surprising to people. And in fact, if you go back and look at the US during the financial crisis, there were economists who were writing letters to the Federal Reserve saying that you know, the US was gonna have hyperinflation because they greatly printed 
money during the financial crisis. So this is the monetary base in the US. This is billions. So we went from a monetary base in 2008 of under a trillion dollars to one of over four trillion. So that's a lot of money printing four times. And look what happened to inflation. Inflation was actually lower over the last decade than it had been over the previous two. So you're in real trouble. What policies do work, and I'm just about to wrap up, uh, fiscal policy do work. So cash transfers and direct spending, but not tax cuts, credible commitments to be irresponsible. So uh, 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 a government that actually says, you know what, we don't care about budget deficits anymore. We're just gonna spend like crazy. Uh, the reason is, is because that's gonna generate inflation expectations. So that will work. Um, what monetary policymakers can do is they can try to do forward guidance, which they can promise to keep interest rates low for a very, very long time. Idea is hopefully you can generate some positive inflation expectations. Um, you also can push down interest rates that aren't zero. Um, but theoretically, anything you can do to get people's inflation expectations going the other direction is going to be a good thing. Last thing. Because of the ZLB and this inflation expectation problem and that paradox of thrift, more government debt is actually going to be desirable. So as I said, right, when that interest rate is at zero, we sort of lost the ability for the market to channel savings into productive investment. And so one way to pick up the slack is the government can literally do the investing for the market. Now, there are long-term productivity issues that can arise in here, but it can be better than the collapse that can happen uh, with the, the paradox of thrift. In addition, government debt should put upward pressure on inflation because after all, the worst outcome of too much government debt is higher inflation. Um, and through progressive taxation, you can spread the cost of the pandemic um, larger. So I think that's it. I, I hit most of the high notes I, I wanted to have. So maybe I'll keep it right there so there's time for questions and we'll go with thank you. So Elizabeth, do we want to? Um... Yeah, so what we'll do now, um, we're just gonna promote everyone who's in the room so that you can turn your cameras on and your um, unmute your microphones, and then you'll be able to ask any questions. Um, feel free to also ask in the chat box as well. That's totally fine. Um, if you've got questions about the content today, or if you've got questions about studying at the university, um, anything about postgraduate um, economics programs, any questions that you might have? I apologize. I realized that was quite fast. It, it, uh, it went by more slow, or it, uh, I got my timing a little off relative to when I practiced it earlier. So I'm sorry about that. So if anybody has a question, you feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Can we just jump in? Sure. Okay, go for it. Uh, good. I think thanks, Chris. Um, I have one question for the um, uh, SEER plus economic model. Um, does the fear of death also include the fear of long-term disability from the virus? Because I think that's one thing that I'm actually worried about is not necessarily dying, but having like respiratory issues for the rest yeah, of the world. Yeah, no, so it, it, it does not, in, in either of those models, there, there isn't a, a, a parameter that governs long-term term complications. Um, and that, but I mean, you can imagine what that would be, right? I mean, that would, you could do that by having a, uh, a higher disutility of getting the virus. So you, you know that there's some probability um, that you're not going to be able, you know, you're going to have a bad outcome. And so you, you don't want to get sick as much. Now, another knock on effect that that would have if you built it into the model is workers would be less productive going forward. So the economic effects of the pandemic would be worse farther out because now you've actually damaged the productive capacity of the economy because you have people who are sicker and so they can't supply labor in the same way that they could before. So that would, you know, you would think that would go towards increasing the incentive um, to, to mitigate, either personally, uh, so the recession would be larger even without government intervention, and on the, the flip side, the incentive to you know, lock down would be stronger for the policymaker. Thank you.
Well, I suppose if, if no one else has a question, I, I do have a follow up. Um, sure. Uh, does the model also uh, take into account the, the fact that with fewer people working, that creates less demand for jobs and so you have people who perhaps wanted to work who have been laid off or uh, had their hours sort of uh, forcibly reduced, that sort of like uh, feedback effect? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so it, it does in the sense that like you saw that right in the the blue line case where your actions could not uh, help your transmission, you know, couldn't affect your trans your ability or your risk of getting the virus, you actually saw labor supply go up. So that that's kind of what the agents were doing, right? They were contemplating that, okay, when people are sick, I have less income as a household. And so I actually need to supply more labor. So that force is in the model. They are actually taking into account the fact that, gee, if X percent of my household can't work, then I actually need to maintain, I, I might want to work more. So that incentive is, is, is in there. Um, in the, the Kaplan, Violante, and Mall paper, there, is, there are more frictions in there. So the one thing that doesn't happen in the Jones paper, right, is because it's a, um, a perfectly competitive economy with no frictions, is there, there's, no, there's no labor search problem. There's not a, if I lose my job, I don't have, I can just wake up tomorrow and I am, I'm right back to work. I don't have to find a new job. There's no risk of finding a lower paying job. Everybody's paid exactly their marginal products. So there's none of that, those concerns. In the Kaplan Violante and, uh, or Mall Violante paper, they do have some of those frictions in there where now you know losing your job is much more devastating because it, it's going to take time for you to get that job back and in addition there's debt contracts in that model so people have to worry about how you're going to you know pay those liabilities that you have while you're unemployed so that that is factored into that model uh, which is partially why i mean when you think about how large the effects are in that model i mean it, it's i mean granted they're, they're playing out in front of us but you know, even when you do nothing and with fiscal transfers uh, on the, you know, the size of what the U.S. did uh, in March, April, May of, you know, two and a half trillion dollars, you're still looking at something like one and a half times monthly income, which, you know, that's like eight, nine percent of GDP over a year that is just gone, even in a I mean, that, that's a recession that's almost twice as large as the financial crisis. And we used to think the financial crisis was the, well, I used to think the financial crisis would be the largest recession I would ever experience. Um, so unfortunately that was not the case. So these are big numbers. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, I don't have any further questions. So someone else wants to jump in? <laughs> I could call on people, but I don't think that'd be very nice. <laughs> you can also ask questions about the program, about classes I teach, about what it's like to be a student at the University of Sydney. You don't have to just ask me questions about um, what we talked about tonight. Oh, sorry, there's a question in the chat box. I'm sorry. Um, uh, masters of economics and the masters of economic analysis. Uh, so this is a great question. So um, the the masters of economics is uh, a degree program that's geared around people who maybe don't have an undergraduate degree in economics. So if you had an undergraduate degree in a related field that you haven't you know taken much economics, then the masters of economics is designed to sort of you know build up your skills so you can you know have a basic fluency in, in the discipline. The Masters of Economic Analysis is set up for people who definitely have undergraduate training in, in economics or in a closely related field, um, and it's a research degree. So you have to um, uh, complete a, a full research thesis. So the Masters of Economics, there's a, a capstone project, which is, um, I would say it, it's closer to a, like a, a, a very in-depth term paper, but it's not a, a full-fledged research paper where the, the Masters of Economic Analysis, um, you know, some of the top students, they're, they're going to produce publishable quality research. There's no requirement that it gets to publishable quality research, but, you know, many people will do it. It's that thorough of a, of a research paper. Um, also, the Masters of Economic Analysis, um, it allows you to take our, our honors courses. 
So if you never did an honors degree in economics, so you did undergraduate economics and then you went off and worked and you said, oh, I, I always wish that I would have done honors in economics to have that experience. The Masters of Economic Analysis allows you to take the honors courses, which uh, in general are, are taught at a, a very, very high level. Um, so if you were thinking about getting a PhD in economics, then you would definitely want to do the Masters of Economic Analysis. If you're very, very mathematically inclined, um, then Masters of Economic Analysis would be the one to go for. If you're, you know, say you did an undergraduate degree in accounting and you've taken, you know, maybe one or two low-level undergraduate uh, classes in economics and you're interested in, you know, learning and getting an economics education, then Masters of Economics is, is probably the right degree program for you because it's going to start off at a lower base. Now, granted, the, the second year courses are going to be, you know, challenging and we're going to, you're going to learn, learn high level stuff, but it's going to, it's going to ease you into it slower than the, the Masters of Economic Analysis, which is, you know, geared towards people who, who already have a, a high, a high uh, level of experience. So does that answer your question? Um, and definitely, if you if you're looking for a you know if you want to do a PhD, definitely do the Masters of Economic Analysis. So I, that is a, a, an issue that we have among students all the time, which then causes problems because people want to transfer because they get into the Masters of Economics and they didn't understand that the Masters of Economic Analysis is really the, the degree program to go to a PhD. Um, no, so if you if you did a major in economics undergraduate, you, there's no prior prior credit. Um, it would be it would be good to have done it, um, but uh, there's there's no there's no crossover. So like I say, the, the courses so in the the first couple of courses, the five thousand level courses you would take in the masters of economics, there is going to be some overlap with say third year economics courses um, to to bring people up to speed. But in general, in the Masters of Economic Analysis, there would be, there would be no overlap uh, unless you already did an economic honors degree. And if you, if you already have done honors in economics, then I don't think either of these degree programs are right for you. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Welcome. Sorry, I might jump in there, Chris. Um, this is Ken speaking. Sure. Um, I'm just, so just to clarify, so if you have like a Bachelor of Commerce background, the Master of Economics is um, the go, and there wouldn't be any other like prior as in knowledge of economics. I, like the Commerce probably just has like you know the very base first year economic subjects. Yeah, like I mean, if, if you've taken you know maybe even in high school, right, you took like intro, macro, and micro, then the Master's of Economic Analysis it, or the Master's of Economics is is going to be the degree program that you would want. But I mean, it also depends on your goal. So if you if you've never if you've never taken economics at all. And you've just decided, you know what? I want to work at the Reserve Bank of Australia. I love monetary policy. Then the Master of Economic Analysis is the the degree that is going to set you up the best to get that job because it's going to be research focused. If you're somebody who is saying, you know, I already you know work in consulting at KMP, KMPG or something, and we're doing more and more economic consulting work, and I want to boost my skills and and learn some new techniques but you have no you know, real goal of, of doing high level economic research that you know, would be like frontier research, you're really doing more like consulting based stuff, then masters of, of, uh, the Masters of Economics is, is probably the, the degree program for you. So I think, I think that's, that's the distinction is, is where are you at? Do you need uh, the base level of education and economics? And is that what you're looking for to just you know, refresh your base and then add some skills, Masters of, of Economics? Are you looking to try to do frontier research um, at you know a high level policy institute or getting a PhD, Masters of Economic Analysis? Yeah, thanks, Chris. We have any final questions? We've run about five minutes over time, so um, we'll wrap up if there are no more questions. All right. All right, well, thank you everybody um, so much for attending. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, please feel free to get in touch 
um, with us at any point if you need more information about the Master of Economics or the Master of Economic Analysis or anything about studying at the University of Sydney. Um, but thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you. Bye.